series. And actually, this influencer series never really went away. It's just I've been so focused on COVID, as we all have been, COVID-19, that I've really been moving forward with the Plant-Based Business Hour, which is this interview series with the innovators and CEOs and analysts and venture capitalists who are really giving us a solution to the future, which is a safer food supply. And of course, we all know, as we're locked in with no jobs, that this is something we desperately care about. But uh, I also want to continue with my awesome vegan celebrity influencer series, which I've been doing now for several years. And I thought I would take that opportunity to bring back someone so very special whom I love having on my show. You maybe know him from Joe Rogan, oh gosh, but also Dr. Oz and the doctors and just all of his own uh, content that he puts out. Dr. Joel Kahn, America's Healthy Doctor, thank you for being with me. Well, thank you. I didn't mess up too bad the first few times because you had me back and I appreciate that. Yes, I love having you because you are such a wealth of knowledge. Um, So just to give people a little background on you in case they haven't seen Dr. Oz or the doctors or listened to Joe Rogan, which may or may not be a good thing. You are located in the Michigan, Detroit area. You have your... um, longevity center there. And you are traditionally a cardiologist, although you opened yourself up personally to a plant-based diet and lifestyle. And so you've worked in these kind of holistic aspects to your cardiology work and your longevity center. Um, So you are an expert in your field, no doubt. But I did say, first of all, that you're from Michigan. So our heart goes out to Michigan because you guys are having quite the uh, spike there. Tell us how life is in Michigan. Yeah, it's tough in southeastern Michigan, centered around Detroit. Uh, I think January, February, given the auto industry, we had a lot of guests back and forth on airplanes from uh, Asia. And at a time right before it was shut down that there really wasn't the concern and the surveillance that we have now. And a lot of people started to spread this disease with its you know, uh, frequent kind of minimal illness. I was ill for three weeks. I don't think I had. COVID-19, I was on an airplane flight from San Juan to Detroit after the holistic cruise, vegan cruise. Uh, But I don't know, because I haven't been able to get an antibody test and nobody around me got sick. Um, But those kind of cases probably spread. So our hospitals are jammed. The Mm -hmm. hospital system I work with has over a thousand COVID-19 patients, which dominates. I mean, it's taken over cardiology, it's taken over the intensive care unit, the emergency room, as we've all read. There's, on the one hand, been a drop in presentation for acute heart attacks, acute strokes in New York City, in Detroit. Are people afraid? I don't think heart attacks and strokes have gone away. Gone away. Uh, Today, it was reported that the number of sudden deaths in New York City have skyrocketed, and it may be people have waited so long they've just died. And some of them are being counted as COVID-19 cases, and some are being appropriately listed as sudden cardiac death. Whatever that is, the most concerning has really been healthcare workers, nurses, respiratory therapists, students, residents, fellows, attendings, intensive care unit, pulmonary doctors, nephrologists that are really at the front line. And some are ill. I have many of my colleagues have been home. I've tried to assist them with some natural approaches on top of all the standard approaches. I've seen some remarkable improvements with that on an outpatient setting. Uh, but some have been sick enough to be admitted. I think we lost <gasps> a lovely young female nephrologist, not in Detroit, uh, but it was in the social media news and probably the general news recently. I mean, tragic young death yes. and others. So this is a real deal. Detroit's gotten smacked. New York's gotten smacked. New Orleans getting smacked. Um, they're predicting the South is not yet seen the full rise mm-hmm. in cases. So I don't like the measures that we've had to take as a country. I mean, as you said, jobless and distressed and lonely and isolated, a very unusual Easter Passover and Ramadan all this week. But I don't criticize it because we've got a monster on our hands and I think we'll have less death and less illness than we would have had we ignored the issue. Yes, so um, I'll sort of jump in there and take a middle ground and say, We didn't ignore the issue. We didn't hop on it perhaps as soon as we could have, given the information that was out there and going out to China. But um, nonetheless, we're sort of doing what we can. This, what 
concerns me as an average citizen, no doctor, mind you, is I feel that we are in this perpetual game of catch up. So rather than taking, you know, the source of the problem, because we have seen other pandemics before, nothing in our lifetime like this, but we have seen uh, zoonotic diseases that then transfer from human to human. It concerns me that we're not making the shift perhaps necessary to catch things at the source. And we're just, you know, chasing a vaccine, which, you know, that, that only helps with COVID-19. What about COVID-20 and COVID-21? Are we just going to find ourselves right back here, doctor? Well, I agree with you. I mean, when I'm not sure we know what is the root cause approach, you know, uh, the difference between standard medicine, which has many wonderful attributes, and functional medicine or integrated medicine, and I have a foot in each of those worlds, is we ask that question, root cause and root prevention. I mean, my heart disease approach is not to wait till you've had a heart attack, although many of my patients come to me after the heart attack. It's 10 years, 20 years before, and I can do detailed blood work and imaging and lifestyle and institute a program and dramatically drop their risk. Or some of my patients are so darn smart, they've done it all before they come to see me. They just want a pat on the back. Those are the best. It's, it's a little difficult right now to apply that to this model. Yeah, would I like to see live food markets across the world that have... Uh, the kind of abysmal care and treatment and infectious risk of animals like we've seen in Wuhan. Sure. Mm -hmm. And they exist, you know, in this country, uh, they, they do in my city of Detroit, without a doubt. Uh, would I like more discussion about plant-based versus, uh, animal foods, but it's not going to come from the politicians, uh, both no. just, it's not going to come from standard medicine. We've been, we had enough heart deaths and cancer deaths that we should have focused on this, you know, in the last year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, I have one hospital that has a Wendy's in the lobby and another hospital has a Wahlburgers attached to it. I mean, and these are, you know, hospital administrative approved, uh, you know, food choices. You know, we're not going to get there and we're not going to see that discussion. Dr. Fauci and the president and uh, Governor Cuomo and such just aren't going to bring up uh, this kind of situation. So, um, you know, and, and can we and how can we boost our immunity to resist or tolerate this disease better. There's lots of thoughts and I'll share some with you, but one has to be very careful because we don't actually, you know, have any studies with this illness to know for sure. We should distance, wash our hands, wear a mask, um, and use a lot of digital technology to connect with as many people as possible. But for the meantime, uh, we've got some rules in Michigan. We can't buy garden seeds. We're you can't buy garden seeds. We can't buy garden seeds as of last week because, because it might keep you in the store a few minutes longer. You can't buy wow. any garden supplies. And it's springtime in Michigan, and you wow. think it'd be a perfect time to encourage people to grow fresh fruits and vegetables and spend the time in their backyard. So there's there's some loopholes, like you can order it online and pick them up, but just can't go in and buy them. Crazy oh. times, and uh, you know these must also be difficult times for administrators and politicians, but uh, there's losing a little confidence in Michigan about how draconian our uh, rules are right now. Well, so you bring up so many things. I'm going to backtrack a little bit, hit on some of them, and then move forward. So you're right. Uh, government never leads, honestly. It's always the individuals who fight for the cause. And then if businesses can get behind that with some real capital, then you see government coming at the end. That notwithstanding, Dr. Fauci did say on Fox News that uh, the slaughterhouses, I'm paraphrasing here, I'm sure someone has the exact quote, and this interface between this this odd interface, that's not the word he used, but this unnatural interface between animals and humans, uh, why would we put ourselves at risk like that? And why is there any reason to not shut them down? So he did come out with that statement, which is something. Um, uh, and then you also talked about, of course, we're social distancing, we're wearing gloves, I do at least, we're wearing our masks. Someone said to me recently, this has not been researched, but I'm asking you, doctor, is it possible that it's airborne? Uh, it's possible. I mean, there's been, again, it's all speculation. There's this idea that there might be a cloud around a jogger and six right. feet might not be enough around a jogger with sweat and heavy breathing and, you know, distance yourself even more on a trail yeah. that came up in the news today. Uh, you know, and is that fright or is that science? And, you know, really right now the focus has been on supporting, you know, super healthy people, super unhealthy people, super sick people, as I meant to say and trying to protect the healthcare workers from not becoming amongst them. So uh, it might be, it might be. And I would, we know that the masks may be imperfect and there's some studies to say they may not 
be all that preventive, but I sure know if you're next to me and you sneeze, I'd much rather you have a mask right. and I have a mask and you deal yes. with your mess and I'll deal with my, yes. uh, my mask and uh, deal with it. But um, again, yes. uh, I was uh, I had an airplane flight a few weeks ago, actually more like two months ago now. I wish I'd worn a mask. It was before this was all obvious, but got sick for a few weeks. Who knows what bug it was, but uh, I'm in favor of a, a masked society that opens up a little bit, maybe by May 1. We are all Zorro. That's all I have to say. Absolutely. Uh, yes, and in my own two cents here, I'm a little disappointed because I think uh, masks are an obvious one. And we were told early on that they don't really help or make a difference. And I'm unclear as to why that communique was given to us all. That seems very clearly, frustrating. Clearly didn't have enough. You know, nobody clearly wished, didn't have enough. Right. Yeah, we never wish suffering on anybody. It is a sad observation, but poignant that, you know, the largest pork producer in the United States had to close their plant. I think yesterday. Absolutely right. 300 workers were uh, confirmed ill from this virus. Again, is that more than the factory producing bagged broccoli that's going on its way to a big box store? I, it appears so because we haven't heard that. And the zoonotic risk of infection and just the, the close and very unhealthy conditions which these workers are in has been so obvious to all of us. Right. But um, we're seeing it play out in a way that uh, sadly confirms it all. But there's human suffering involved, so I don't celebrate it. No, no, nor do I. And of course, I, I'm sure everyone listening is like, get to what's going to boost my immune system already. But I'm coming to that, people. Believe me, I'm coming to that. I just first wanted to ask and... Um, Confuse me if we're, or excuse me if we're repeating ourselves a little bit because we were chatting, of course, in the green room before. And so uh, maybe we've touched on this already a little bit, but I'd like to hear more from you if you think the medical community, like you said, we've never really seen anything like this before, although we have, we've had glimmers and we've had, you know, shimmerings. Uh, what is the medical community learning from this? Because we don't want to be right back here. Well, I think on the positive side, there's been a tremendous amount of collegiality, respect, the role of nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, students, residents, fellows, that old school, I'm the attending physician and I rule the roost is uh, hopefully uh, broken down to mm -hmm. make the teamwork even stronger. Because truly, uh, you know, the nurses are probably as much in the front line as any occupation. They've gotten sick. Yes. We actually did, as I think about it, lost a 54-year-old nurse in Detroit last week from this disease, and there may be others. So uh, that's probably the positive news, uh, appreciation, support, almost like a forming of a union, protect mm. us, protect us. We don't want to go to, the, you know, to war uh, without the proper, you know, um, supplies. Um, what else have we learned uh, that we can uh, you know, adapt pretty quickly? If you go back eight weeks and look at what's going on, at least in my Detroit, tent hospitals, we've mm -hmm. taken over two of the largest convention centers, which of course are empty right now, and turned them into field hospitals that opened this week. I mean, the ability to pull this all together, to turn Ford Motor into a ventilator company and General Motors into a ventilator company. Um, you know, we did it in World War II. None of us probably listening to this were around back then. But uh, it's a proud moment that, uh, again, they've pulled together to do this. We could say two weeks quicker, two weeks not quicker. These, you know, these nobody had this playbook, January 1, 2020, that this was uh, on the uh, on the anticipation. I've seen many other examples of we have a local company in Detroit that just brought in millions of masks from China because they produce uh, some mm -hmm. stuff in China. They actually had a drag the Israeli airline El Al from China to Detroit because no other airlines would fly from China to Detroit nonstop. And we're not even allowed to have El Al in Detroit. They had to get special uh, compensation and disposition, whatever. But the bottom line is that those, these kind of examples are heartwarming. I mean, um, I, I don't know what other lessons yet, um, but I, I sure know we sure wouldn't have put this on the playbook. January 1 is what we'd be dealing with in medicine. Now, I have to say, my heart still is in cardiology, and there's a lot of work to do. And I'm not cynical enough to say we should have had the same response to heart disease and diabetes and obesity. I sure wish we would have. Mm -hmm. We really would have attacked the root cause over the last decade. We had all the data we needed. You know, it's a, it, it, there's an old thing about you put a frog in hot water and slowly turn it up. I hate it that thing. Jump out till it's dead as opposed yeah. to you put it in. This has been such a slow 
for, we accept the fact that a 42 year old man or woman can die of a heart attack, a police officer, a fireman, something that makes the news, uh, a rapper. And we're sad for a day and we move on. We, it doesn't rock us the way this has rocked us, but we need to go back at the end of this and ask the question about chronic disease in general and how can we address it? I, I, sh I sure hope so, because I would think from a scientific perspective, one would want to go to the source and not just constantly be chasing after the right. symptoms. And we have done such a remarkable job of adapting quickly. Uh, and so as a country, I think that's beautiful. Although personally, I would like to see more leadership unifying the country. I don't see a lot of those messages. I just see a lot of, you know, the economy is going to be back open at some point and I call the shots kind of stuff. But I, I think there is an opportunity to unite us more strongly as a country. Country, whatever my two cents. Um, but I, I'm concerned that we might not really get on board with, um, you know, trying to find ourselves not back here again, rather than being better prepared the next time we are. So I wonder if in the medical community, um, is anyone at all, and I understand they're busier than busy, particularly in Michigan, but are any of the doctors making the connection between eating meat and, and the handling of that meat? So the care or lack of care for the animals in such close confinements, which make these yeah. diseases transfer really quickly, because it's a scientific question. I'd love to talk animals, but it's a scientific yeah. thing how quickly they, the disease transfers from animal to animal and then becomes zoonotic and goes to people. And then we travel around the world. So it spreads really fast. You'd think they'd be concerned with that. No. Yeah. You know, in our plant community, we see that in the postings and podcasts and uh, YouTubes and such, but you know, an easy way to go is to go to pubmed.gov, which is the national library of medicine. Anybody can access. And they list the trending articles of the day in the week. And, you can just scroll through 100, 200 articles. They're all about COVID-19 right now. There's got to be other mm -hmm. stuff being published, but the trending articles. And I do that every day, and I've not seen a single article that you'd say has made, made mm -hmm. mainstream medical journals on that topic. And Is it because it's too early? Will we get there? Know, or uh, I don't know who's going to drive down in an investigative way mm -hmm. in China and try and... Mm -hmm. It, was it this lab that was a few miles away from the mm -hmm. market? Was it the market? You know, there is talk about case zero uh, mm -hmm. uh, being discussed. I think it's a little early to, you know, to see that and see the mainstream media or the mainstream medical world uh, latch on to that. I really think it's like, you know, the duck may look somewhat distressed, but it's the little feet going crazy underneath. There's just tons of work being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much to be done. You're you're absolutely right. Well, uh, for all the wonderful people who are holding in for the politics medical question, give us your top three tips to boost our immune system. Um, well, I, I, it might go beyond three, but I mean, it's you got to mention the lifestyle ones for sure. I mean, get the best sleep of your life. Seven mm -hmm. hours, eight hours. Don't shortcut it. A lot of people are up at night right now or during the day, depending if the job rotates because of financial stress and just general worry and watching the news all the time. But try and shut that off. And whether you need you know, a hot bath or a Epsom salts or lavender essential oils or full spectrum hemp oil or melatonin, and come back to melatonin in a minute. Um, where you're your singing my song, doctor. Blue light Sounds great. Glasses and dark room. Get your sleep. Don't shortcut it. Number two, get some fitness in. If you can walk, if you can uh, stand, if you can dance, if you can garden, if you can, you know, use your home gym in any way you can, uh, you can do push-ups on the kitchen counter. It counts. Uh, number three, eat the best you've ever eaten and just up rainbow colored fruits and vegetables. Uh, they still seem to be generally available, frozen if you need to, uh, and stock up with frozen in case the produce line gets a little tight. Uh, don't forsake that. Some stress reduction technique. I'm big on short little meditative practices, whether they're app-based, little 12-minute uh, meditation called the Kirtan Kriya. That's actually the fourth one. So the fifth one is, do supplements matter? And very cautiously said, because it's a very contentious and hot field, we don't know. Are there reasonable people talking in a very similar list? There are. I like to quote the chairman of the Department of Critical Care Medicine at East Virginia Medical School, is named Paul Merrick major academic. He's the editor of the Journal of Critical Care Medicine. This guy's not, you know, there just to sell some online vitamin supply. And he's listed five that he suggested may be of value because they're inexpensive, they're widely available, and they're likely to do no harm. 
And his five, and I quote a good academic physician, are vitamin C, I'm talking now supplements, eat foods rich in vitamin C, obviously, and please do, always. But vitamin C, 500 milligrams twice a day for most of us. Vitamin D, two to 4,000 international units a day. Of course, there's vegan versions, if you're concerned that most of us comes from lanolin, from sheep. Number three is um, melatonin, about a milligram at night. Melatonin has immune system functions. It's not only for sleep. And I was very surprised to see him bring that up, uh, but he brought it up for its immune value, not just uh, uh, its sleep value, but that's important too. We want to talk about an unusual one most haven't heard of called quercetin, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. It's an antioxidant from onions, garlic, um, cherries, apples, very powerful antioxidant with some good immune and decongestant effects both. I've used it for years for seasonal allergies as a natural mm. decongestant, 500 milligrams once a day, twice a day. And the last one is zinc. A lot of people are starting to hear about zinc. Zinc existed in the discussion of the plant-based world. Dr. Joel Furman would bring up the fact that focus on zinc-rich foods, sesame seeds and sunflower seeds and legumes and such. But uh, Dr. Merrick is suggesting actually 50 milligrams of zinc a day. That's about three times higher than we normally used to talk about. And he's talking about that for just the next month or six weeks, not for a lifelong plan. So uh, there's the academic playlist. It's what I've suggested to my patients. I like where it came from. It's a written protocol that I can share with you if you want uh, and share with your audience. But um, none of that is proven. All of it's inexpensive and unlikely to harm. Uh, and a lot of people already might have some of that in a plant-based multivitamin, for example. Okay, but basically the theory is these things could potentially be, you can't hear me. You can't hear me? Hello? You can hear me now, right? I can't hear you. You can't can you hear, hear me? me. I can hear you, no problem. Uh, can somebody let me know if um, they can hear us? Um, Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. All right. You can hear me? Can you hear me? You still can't hear me. Um, hold on. Uh, it's all good. Well, uh, but wait, I want more from you. Um, I don't know why this would be. Hold on. Don't Give me two. Why. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Stay. 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 Let me uh, figure out. It's always something. Isn't it always something? And um, you don't have earbuds, do you? Okay, everybody can hear us both. Um, okay, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm texting you. Okay, hold on everyone. Uh, hold on everybody, I'm texting him. Wow. I'm texting him the questions, everyone, because he can't what hear me. What are my predictions? Well, yes. if you can all hear us, this is cool. We just are first ever uh, <laughs> awesome vegans done by texting. Uh, that's resourceful and good for you, Elizabeth. Uh, predictions. Uh, I think we have to reopen the economy, May 1. Mm. Um, perhaps there's a few mm. isolated industries, cruise ships, perhaps are not going to uh, see much action. I think you know, if we want to impose mandatory masks in public and more hand washing stations, uh, God bless us, uh, maybe some social distancing. But um, I, I hope we're seeing in major centers the peak and perhaps starting to see a little drop. I think in Detroit, we're just starting to see that. But we don't know if it's the only wave and we don't know if there's a second wave. We're just going to have to live through this as we institute in Detroit where you've launched the largest antibody testing research program. Cool. Uh, my hospital system has 38,000 employees and they can all go in and get tested now and again in about 10 days to see if they're not just COVID diseased, but if they've ever got the antibody in their blood so they might be able to return to work or uh, relax their uh, lockdown a bit because they seem to be anti antibody positive. And we hope being antibody positive protects us. You know, there's a lot of uh, things we do not know with certainty. Um, but I think the rest of 2020, we're going to have some issues and some occurrences. And, you know, I just, this thing hasn't made its way through the South and the Southwest. So I think we'll keep seeing sadly cases and such. 
Um, um, sorry, what I, do I wish I knew 10 years ago that I know now. Well, if I were a hospital administrator, I wish uh, you know, I could have foreseen this to have enough personal protective equipment for nurses and students and doctors warehoused away um, or the ability to quickly turn on industry to produce them. Uh, you know, that is probably the saddest chapter of this besides the personal loss is yes. the risk and stress. And you can just follow doctors on Twitter if you want to see example after example of really pretty much outrage over the last month about yes. we're going to war. We don't have a gun and we don't have a helmet and we don't have bullets as an analogy. It's sad. When did you know that you would go vegan and never go back? What's my favorite junk food? Uh, when did I go vegan and never go back? Probably the first week. That was 1977. I was no. an undergraduate in Ann Arbor, and the salad bar was gorgeous, and everything else was gray. And uh, one week was enough to convince me this was a great way to survive. It was survival. I didn't know the word vegan or vegetarian or tree hugger or uh, you know, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. I learned all that stuff later. In fact, John Robbins died for a new America is what really cemented the deal. But that was a few years later. And my favorite vegan junk food is not really junk, but homemade pizza. Um, so right now it's Passover. So it's matzah and it's tomato sauce and it's arugula so good. and it's mushrooms and it's pumpkin seeds and it's onions and garlic. I mean, I call pizza an excuse for a salad, but it's kind of fun to do it on top of uh, typically more of a, a corn crust or a cauliflower crust and all the rest. Um, I want to see somebody come up with a cauliflower mask. That would be a good Ooh. use. Since we can do everything else with cauliflower. I would get that. So and, one last question for you. Uh, I think. Oh, one more. Do you think we will see worse flu uh, covers now than uh, worse flu COVID-19? So yeah, many. There is a lot of flu out there. There are well, I have many, many medical colleagues, nursing colleagues, and all that are very sick at home and mm -hmm. recovering, and their test comes back negative for COVID nineteen. Now, uh, most of them were swabbed for flu and weren't abnormal, weren't positive. Um, I think there's a recognized a increasing problem that false negative uh, COVID tests. Oh, okay. uh, these tests were, you know, rammed through quickly and all these people sure clinically seem to have it. Loss of smell, stomach mm -hmm. upset, fevers, shortness of breath, cough, the whole thing. Um, uh, is there anything worse than what we're going through? I sure hope not. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how many more times we can do this yes. Uh, yes. unless we really address the root cause. And I just, I'm not optimistic the government's going to embrace the real solution or maybe the real solution of whole food, plant-based lifestyle, mm -hmm. natural immune boosting education. Um, and that's our obligation is to teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joel Kahn, I know that you can't hear me, but I will say that I am so grateful Thank to you, you for Thank all you. of this wonderful information. Everybody, you have your marching orders. It's uh, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, melatonin, and quercetin. So uh, you got it here from Dr. Joel Kahn. I am so grateful for your time, doctor. It's the Awesome Vegans Influencer Series. It hasn't gone away. It is still what I do along with the Plant-Based Business Hour. Dr. Joel Kahn, I will let you get back to your very busy life. Thank Thank you. And together we're taking back our health and the health of the planet. Bye, everyone.